Very happy to uh, introduce uh, Nicola Di Blasio, senior fellow uh, and the Environmental and Natural uh, Resources Program uh, and Science and Technology at uh, at uh, Harvard University. Nicola, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you, Morgans, for the introduction. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and I've already seen a lot of uh, colleagues and friends uh, around, uh, and I'm looking forward to catching up with you guys. So today, I would like to share with you my views on uh, hydrogen and the opportunities and challenges associated with its uh, deployment at scale. I'm sorry about my voice, but I've had problems these last few days. So. Our overall research question can be summarized by the title of the presentation. Basically, is there a pot of gold at the end of the hydrogen rainbow? Throughout the presentation, I would like you to keep in mind the three key insights that won't come as a surprise to you all. The first one is that hydrogen could indeed play a key role in the carbonizing energy system, including hard to abate sectors but innovation and partnerships are going to be key. Uh, the point that Nadine made before, uh, it's very true. If you think that 80% of the cost of deploying new energy infrastructure at scale is covered by the private sector, partnership between public and private will be key going forward. Despite the uh, universal access to renewable energies, geopolitical and market dependencies uh, in a low-carbon world uh, are still going to persist. They're just going to be different. And finally, it's key to remember that the geopolitics of renewable hydrogen will be comparable to natural gas, not renewables. So we will have regional markets. Well, we don't even have regional markets at the moment, but they will start as regional markets, so a bottom-up approach. And ideally, they will become international and global. But we will see the same challenges that we've seen with natural gas. Now, you see here, I talk about renewable hydrogen, and the point that I would like to make from, from the beginning is that unless you are an incumbent in fossil fuel, it doesn't make any sense to look at anything else but renewable hydrogen. Hydrogen produced by water spirit through electrolyzers using renewable energy, because let's talk for a second about uh, blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen, uh, to deploy blue hydrogen at scale, you actually need to rely on the deployment of two infrastructures, so you double your risk and your challenges, the one for CCUS and the one for hydrogen itself. So um, my group, uh, my team looks at, uh, at whether in a low-carbon energy world, as I mentioned, uh, and there will be a more uniform access to energy, of all, or all dependencies will perpetuate and new ones might emerge. We use an analytical framework and a mathematical model to model how basically where country, regions, and stakeholders are today and where they want to be in 2030, 2050. And we use this uh, to basically provide policymakers and other stakeholders with the means to make informed decisions on policy instruments, uh, technology innovation funding, and long term investments in enabling infrastructure. Oops. OK, so you probably have already seen this. This is more a reminder to me on why I'm so excited about hydrogen. Uh, as you all know, hydrogen is a staple, has been a staple in the petrochemical and refining industry for the past 150 years. It touches every single sector of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of energy. Uh, we have had many waves uh, of interest in the past uh, about hydrogen. The last one was in 2000. We all know how it ended. But at the time, there were two main issues that are different now. The first one was that uh, 
hydrogen was uh, being considered for the mobility sector and uh, mainly for light duty vehicles. And uh, already in 2000, the development and deployment cycles of battery EVs were much farther down the innovation cycle than hydrogen. The second key difference is that in 2000, the cost of renewable energy was much, much higher than today. So for someone like me that has worked his entire career in the energy sector, hydrogen basically gives me once in a lifetime opportunity to think about designing and deploying a scale new energy infrastructure. One point that I will make more than once during the presentation, we need to do this in a way that we don't replicate the same mistakes and the same inefficiency or fall in the same traps of the past. So if anyone had any doubt, and I think I did mention this slide actually, uh, about the fact that we are having a hydrogen momentum, uh, the investment pipeline, direct investments, has gone, grown to 320 billion US dollars. Uh, we have more than 1,050 projects, uh, up from 680 something less, uh, a little more than a year ago. Now, the important thing to keep in mind that these are announced projects. So, are they all going to be sanctioned? Probably not. And you might wonder, is this good or bad? And uh, until recently, I thought it was bad. I'm now convinced that it's actually good because of uh, Another challenge that I see facing uh, the deployment of hydrogen at scale, which is the subsidies. Um, I fear that we will see a first mover competitive advantage uh, that might create uh, similar market asymmetries and distortions that we've seen in the past. But I'll talk about this a little later in more detail. So here, two things to, to move other things to look at. Europe is still leading the race, the hydrogen race, but North America on a year-to-year -year basis has been the one with the greatest increment, uh, mainly due to the Inflation Reduction Act uh, that we will talk about in a second. So uh, don't laugh at the slide. I actually did it myself. I usually don't do them. Uh, so it doesn't look very professional. So, there is no doubt there is an unprecedented momentum, but uh, there are uh, key challenges facing deployment of hydrogen at scale, mainly due to cost, scalability, and public perception. And uh, here you can see we have a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, infrastructure availability, long distance shipping, water availability, uh, carbon intensities, uh, public concerns, leakages, uh, markets, we don't have any hydrogen markets, and cost. Cost has been the main one up to now, especially when it comes to, to, to green hydrogen or, or renewable hydrogen. And to all of these, uh, I would actually add now subsidies. And it might sound counterintuitive, but I'll explain why I think it's a, it's a challenge. So, as you all know, uh, once we produce the hydrogen molecule, the molecule is the same no matter the process. The difference in the process is uh, depending on the uh, feedstock that you use, uh, are basically, in the end, uh, the carbon intensities associated with, the, with the, the hydrogen molecules and the cost. Here is just to give you an idea of, uh, of the cost for hydrogen production in China, uh, split by fuel cost, OPEX and CAPEX, and as you can see, uh, renewable hydrogen is still more expensive than uh, f than renewable hydrogen than uh, hydrogen from coal, even with the carbon capture utilization and storage. Uh, this is true almost uh, everywhere. So to address uh, to address uh, the cost uh, uh, challenge. Uh, uh, countries around the world have started to provide subsidies to the production of, uh, of green hydrogen. In, uh, in the US, we talk about uh, carbon intensities. In Europe, we talk about colors. But the concept is the same. How do we make uh, uh, renewable hydrogen, which is the only one that has a carbon intensity of zero, well, together with pink hydrogen, hydrogen from nuclear. But then the key question in my mind becomes, 
Are subsidies now winning the hydrogen race over the underlying economic fundamentals, over resources potentials and efficiency? Are these uh, subsidies going to create uh, unbalances uh, that we've seen in the past, uh, market distortions? So let me show you with some numbers what I mean by this. So the Infl Inflation Reduction Act has introduced uh, uh, production tax credits for green hydrogen, so, sorry, for clean hydrogen production. And uh, you can see in the table there on the bottom uh, right uh, that uh, they go depending on the carbon intensity, the kilogram of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen, they go from 60 cents to $3 per kilogram. Now, the, the dynamics that we're already seeing is that, uh, let's take again uh, blue hydrogen uh, as an example. Uh, blue hydrogen, even with a 90% carbon capture factor, which is high, uh, can only get a $1 per kilogram uh, incentive compared to the $3 that uh, green hydrogen, clean hydrogen will get. And so the result is that uh, we, we fear, I don't know if I should say if we fear, but the cost of production of green hydrogen could become cost negative in the US by the end of uh, the decade. And we have already seen this. We have seen uh, something like this uh, with the renewable energy. When incentives uh, in the United States were allowing uh, renewable energy producer to bid negatively into the grid uh, to get their electricity dispatched. So basically, because of the incentives, uh, there was this huge market dis uh, disruption where you could pay the grid operator to get your electricity. And this has created issues with uh, other technologies like nuclear that could not cycle. So the, the, the point then becomes that while subsidies can uh, significantly accelerated the deployment and, and, and adoption of new technologies, in this case, hydrogen, they also risk creating what I mentioned before, a first mover competitive advantage at the expense of uh, the underlying uh, economic fundamentals. And uh, so this is a scenario which no one really wants, where <laughs> basically there is a rush to build a, a projects that, that without subsidies don't stand a chance uh, to be economically competitive. And so an uncoordinated subsidy raise, uh, raise would be much, much more expensive, and I'll give you some numbers in a second, less effective, uh, and I have two examples. And so it's going to be key to have a system level analysis in which taking in consideration the key underlying uh, resource potentials and efficiency, <coughs> sorry, to do our analysis and to determine which are the best uh, opportunities to allocate capital, public capital, which by definition is uh, finite. So, and only in this way, we're going to be able to avoid falling into the inefficiencies and the traps of the past. So let me start with some numbers before I give you two, two examples, which, by the way, you can imagine by the picture what they are. Uh, so the first, as for numbers, we finished a study for the European Union on the future of, uh, of uh, green hydrogen in the EU. And uh, we assumed, uh, I'm just giving you this as a reference, we assume that by 2050, uh, the EU demand for green hydrogen will be about 75 million tons per year. Basically, today's global demand. And uh, we looked uh, at uh, what would have been the cost of uh, deploying the most efficient and most cost-effective uh, hydrogen infrastructure for the block. Now, the fact that uh, I'm talking about being cost effective, it won't come as a surprise. We were trying to replicate what has happened with natural gas and uh, see whether there would be dependencies similar to Russia in the case of, uh, of, of uh, renewable hydrogen. Now, the cost of deploying this energy, hydrogen infrastructure at scale, if member states, uh, which they are not, 
where to work together to build the most efficient one, it's about 2.3, 2.4 trillion US dollars. If every state goes uh, by itself, it's going to be two or three times more expensive. And, all, and with this, I could rest my case. So two examples of, uh, of how a regional approach to the deployment of energy infrastructure has created the key issues in markets. One is natural gas in Europe. Um, as you know, natural gas here in Europe has, was de deployed the infrastructure by national ch champions, the ENI, uh, the Total, the BP uh, here, uh, and others. They never had a system a view, a European system view in mind, and the inefficiency and the added cost of this became a stark reality when the war in Ukraine started. In the US, we have something similar with the grid. Uh, I say the grid in the US is an oxymoron because it, we don't have a grid in the US. We have a patchwork of, uh, of state grids uh, that don't even interact with each other. So what about uh, resources and efficiencies? And here the, the academic part starts. I hope you were not expecting me not to do that. So as you know, the cost of production of hydrogen, green hydrogen, varies significantly between countries. This because uh, the cost of uh, electricity is different uh, as a full load uh, um, operating hours vary greatly based on solar radiation and wind speeds. And on the left, you can see an average long-term cost breakdown for renewable hydrogen, where you can see that the feedstock, in this case electricity price, is the uh, highest cost component, the first cost component, but it's true for any other, uh, as if you th think back at the slide on China, it's true for any other process. So, as I mentioned, what we try to do is that we look at where country, region, and stakeholders are today. Uh, in terms of market dynamics, geopolitics, but also of positionings along value chains. And we try to take a picture of the situation to today, and then we look into the future and we try to address which are the most effective and efficient policy instruments, uh, technology innovation funding, and long-term investment in enabling infrastructure. So the role that countries could play in future renewable hydrogen markets depends on their resource endowments and the infrastructure potential. We do this analysis considering three different variables. The first one is renewable energy resource endowment, which is the combined solar and wind generation potential in comparison to primary energy demand. So here the assumption that we make is that the renewable energy available to produce green hydrogen is renewable energy that does not go in competition with any other electrification process. We also consider space availability through population density. Now, because we are talking about fresh uh, green, uh, green hydrogen, uh, fresh water is a key variable. And so we look uh, at uh, fresh water resources endowment. Sorry. And here we take uh, <coughs> internal renewable fresh water resources as, uh, as the key variable. Now, when it comes to infrastructure, because uh, as you all know, there is no hydrogen infrastructure deployed at scale around the world. There are some pipelines in the US and some pipelines here in uh, Europe, mainly for captive markets. Another reason why we don't have uh, uh, hydrogen markets uh, at the moment. Uh, we need to use a proxy. So the proxy that we use is based on the following assumption. Countries which in the past have been able to deploy energy infrastructure at scale would be able to do so also in the case of hydrogen. And here we use the overall infrastructure score in the Global Competitiveness Index, which allows us also to take into consideration more financial variables like the weighted average cost of capital, country risk, and so on. Based on these variables, we cluster countries in two five groups. 
And the five groups that we have are what we call export champions, which are countries that could meet their internal demand and export hydrogen to the rest of the world. And here we have countries like Australia, United States, Morocco, and Norway. Then we have what we call water constraints producers, countries like Saudi Arabia and China. As you know, China overall is not water constraints, but the regional uh, differences make the dynamic really important. Then we have uh, what we call major importers, may, most of Europe, Japan, South Korea. We have self-sufficient producer or regional exporters, Turkey, Spain, and Thailand. And then uh, we have what we call infrastructure constrained producer, most parts of South America. On this, we draw the geopolitical map of hydrogen, which shows a new world of importing and exporting nations. And we use this map to, to do an analysis, uh, the analysis that I mentioned before, on where country or regions are today and where they, they, they want to get. So in the case of the European Union, the, we looked at three different scenarios, which were hydrogen, what we called hydrogen independence, where we prioritize energy independence, and we look whether the EU member states could meet their internal demand internally. We looked at regional imports. Uh, this was the cost optimization scenario that I mentioned before. And then we looked at long distance imports from export champions like the United States and Australia, where here was uh, energy uh, security the key variable. Now, this is, if you wish, it's more from a uh, supply point of view. We look also at the demand side, and we do a similar analysis um, by looking, basically, the positioning of uh, stakeholders uh, along value chains and uh, whether they could uh, upgrade uh, along value chains, uh, what would be needed to do this. If you... <laughs> If you want, basically, the, the underlying question that we look into here, and uh, we focus on the industrial sector, um, mainly on uh, ammonia, uh, green steel, and methanol. Well, what we, we look, we, to simplify, basically, what we're trying to see is whether adoption of green hydrogen at scale, how it would affect value chains, and whether industrial clusters, as we know them today, are going to migrate closer to where green hydrogen is produced, or vice versa. And whether countries could upgrade along value chains or not, or stakeholders. So here we have, again, three variables. Uh, we like uh, them in freeze. Uh, so resource endowment, which is what I just uh, described. Uh, we have industrial production, today industrial production of a country. And then we have economic relatedness. Uh, if the country possesses similar, oh, I'm running out of time, similar applications uh, uh, that could bring to bear to this. And uh, so on the basis of this, uh, we identify five more groups, uh, which go from front runners uh, to upgraders, countries that uh, could upgrade the long value chains. Then we have countries that can only be green hydrogen importers, green hydrogen exporters, and bystanders. And then uh, we draw another map, and we use these two maps to do the analysis that I mentioned before. So let me, yes, let me conclude with some uh, brief recommendation and a summary. Nation and regions wishing to adopt uh, green hydrogen, clean hydrogen, whatever you want to call it, at scale, should prioritize uh, analysis and planning now, because the effects of policy choices and investment decisions taken today will be felt decades into the future. And uh, stakeholders also need uh, to define now what role they want to have within hydrogen markets, because uh, the policy and investment choices will be a function of this. Uh, there is no opportunity to wait till the end to take this decision. And uh, the path ahead requires understanding how adoption of green hydrogen will affect energy value chain and uh, your positioning within them. Again, where you want to be, it's, it's key. This requires identifying infrastructure bottlenecks 
and addressing financial gaps in specific markets or, <coughs> sorry, or application. What is going to be challenging here, extremely challenging, is synchronizing investments with growth in supply and demand. And I will conclude by repeating what I said a couple of times already. If you want to develop competitive and secure hydrogen markets, this will require close coordination between all stakeholders. Because if we don't do this, we are going to replicate the same mistakes of the past, and it's going to be more costly and more inefficient. Thank you. Oh. I would like to thank uh, my team for all the hard work they've been doing on this. Thank you. <coughs>Thank you very much. Uh, we already have a lot of uh, questions uh, related to subsidies and, and other aspects. So I'm going to join you over here so I also we can see the screen. Um, but, so but I'm going to answer the first one. <laughs> Is that okay? So I didn't, I didn't want to give you the impression that uh, I'm against subsidies. I think subsidies are key to accelerate uh, adoption. But uh, we should not throw money away. That was the only point I was trying to make. And bringing something to cost negative, where like with renewables, you can bid the, into the grid negatively, that's uh, my definition of throwing money away. Sorry. <laughs> you mentioned uh, these uh, different types of filters, so water, renewables, infrastructure. Um, I know uh, you also use the term hydrogen in general. If you think about the derivatives like ammonia and methanol and, and, and kerosene for that matter in, in export, uh, any reflection if you added, uh, for instance, bio, biogenic CO2 as a filter, how would, how would your map look like? With biogenic hydrogen? Or, uh, sorry. So if you use biogenic CO2 to create, for instance, kerosene or methanol and, and, and those aspects. So if you look at derivatives, uh, and I'm not sure whether I'm going to actually answer your question, I, what I find most uh, fascinating, it's, it's actually ammonia. And let me tell you why. Uh, when we started doing our research uh, into derivatives, I was actually looking at ammonia as a, as a derivative, uh, as a commodity. And, uh, and then uh, my reasoning started to change, and I'll give you an example of, uh, of why. And I started to think whether ammonia could become a true enabler for hydrogen markets. In the study that we did on the European Union, the, the hydrogen security scenario that I mentioned, where we bring in uh, hydrogen from uh, uh, long distance export champion like Australia and the United States, we see an interesting dynamic. So in the regional approach, uh, the main exporter of uh, uh, green hydrogen to Europe is Morocco with 43%. And so again, we would replicate the dependency like we have on natural gas from Russia today. Now, we looked at two different scenarios uh, for transportation, one liquefied hydrogen and one ammonia. And when we go into the scenario of uh, long distance imports, we see something totally different that I was not expecting. So if we ship by liquefied hydrogen, Australia is too far away. The economics are not there. But if we look at the US and we look at liquefied hydrogen, uh, it really doesn't get, US doesn't get into the mix. It, out of the 75 million tons, we get half a million ton from the US, so nothing. But if we ship by ammonia, the US, the US actually become the first exporter to Europe with 21%. And so the question then became, is ammonia going to be a true enabler for hydrogen uh, uh, market creation. And uh, if we assume this, uh, uh, and I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but if we assume this, uh, then uh, the question about uh, are industrial cluster going to, to relocate close to where uh, hydrogen is being produ produced? Well, in the case of ammonia, then we have the answer. Yes, they will, because you, need to, you would need to have ammonia to transport hydrogen anyway. 
I can see there's a couple <coughs> of questions also on the uh, difference between renewable-based hydrogen versus gas-based hydrogen, uh, as an example uh, there. And uh, you mentioned uh, that there are some uh, scale limitations on, uh, on, of course, currently on, 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 on what we'll call renewable-based hydrogen. But uh, if, you, if you look at, at gas-based hydrogen, for instance, like blue or turquoise and all of these colors, uh, but, but, but that level there, how do you see that? Wouldn't that be more competitive? Again, I'll go back to what I said before. In order for blue hydrogen, turquoise hydrogen is another interesting case uh, because there you produce uh, carbon black. A lot of, uh, of the companies looking into car in, uh, turquoise hydrogen Today, they say that they could sell carbon black uh, uh, as a product. Well, like in every feasibility study or adoption of a new technology, that is true today. Uh, even with today's production, we would saturate the carbon uh, black demand in the world pretty quickly. And then you would actually have to pay for people to come and get your carbon black. You would not get a revenue out of that. Going back to blue, the challenge with blue is Less expensive, also because we don't factor in today some externalities, but you need to deploy two, two, uh, two infrastructure, as I said, one for carbon capture and one for hydrogen. So unless you already plan to deploy the carbon uh, capture infrastructure, why would you want to do this? Um, good answer. Um, there's a couple of questions also, uh, and you can see on the top, for instance, this one on... Uh, on other variables to understand your map a bit better. So for instance, cost of capital, I think you mentioned that you have taken that as part of your infrastructure yes. part, but political stability and other aspects, how do you see that? So the proxy that we use actually allows us uh, uh, to take into consideration all these uh, variables because the global competitive index uh, takes into consideration these variables when giving a score to, the, to a country in terms of infrastructure, energy infrastructure. And if we look into uh, a couple of other aspects uh, that have been asked about, and that's especially around uh, Latin America and, and their role, uh, could you elaborate a bit more? So, and I saw the part about Chile there. So Chile, you know, it's uh, long and, and thin, and that's why uh, they have had problems even today with deploying energy infrastructure at scale. And uh, Chile is another example of what I would call a first mover, uh, quote unquote, advantage. Up to now, uh, Chile has been perceived as one of, uh, of, and rightly so, one of the key players in producing green hydrogen. Again, hydrogen that is produced and exported directly from where it's produced uh, because uh, they won't be able to, to deploy the needed infrastructure at scale within country. But now things are changing because Brazil has announced that they want to go into uh, green hydrogen and because of the scale, because of the resources and endowments that Brazil have, uh, it's going to be a tough competition now for Chile. Also because Brazil is on, in the right spot to export to Europe. Thank you very much, Nicola, for a very insightful uh, presentation and also discussion afterwards. There's, of course, a lot of uh, unanswered <laughs> questions. Uh, I hope Nicola, he, he's here also later today, so, so you can grab him uh, also for that. Uh, we will now move Thank on you. to the program. So, uh, Sasha, 